Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm hoping that you can hear me. I usually don't live stream from this this particular channel, but I wanted to cover some things um, that was brought to my attention, and I thought I would share it with the world. I share my knowledge. If you ask, my social media links are all below. If you can get a hold of me and you have a question, I'm happy to answer it. If you can't, um, I'm easy to find if you're local <laughs> in the Myrtle Beach, South Carolina area. You can get a hold of me and I'm happy to come and take a look at your lawn and and give you a free evaluation. No obligation. Um, with that said, today I was given some free advice that started last night on, on a Facebook chat. It was an actual page that's here local. And uh, I was giving someone some advice. And luckily, someone else chimed in, too. <laughs> and uh, he was very knowledgeable. And we were on the same page with a lot of different a lot of responses. So with that said, I want to go ahead and cover some of those topics today that I that kind of got brought up. Um, first of all, I'll use centipede grass because it's pretty prevalent here in uh, Myrtle Beach. If you have centipede grass and currently at this time, you're seeing what looks like damage to your lawn. Let's say <laughs> it looks like drought stress or... Um, or something of the effect, maybe a disease. Maybe you think you have brown spot. Maybe you think you have brown patch. I will get into all these things. First, do some of the free research, the free things that you can do to check and see. I'm going to show some examples here. So I hope you guys follow along with me. This is real simple. You want to check for chinch bugs if you have centipede. Centipede is usually um, very resilient to any insects. There's only about two that really affect it that's, that you're gonna see and be like, oh, I freak out. I'm like, oh my God, my guard looks terrible. Please help. Chinch bugs. So with chinch bugs, what you wanna do is get an empty two liter, cut the top off, cut the bottom off, shove it into the ground. Basically, you just want an empty center section here. Shove it into the ground really far, fill it full of water and wait about five minutes. Anything that floats to the top, like any grass or any other little, um, <laughs> any other little thing that floats to the top, that may, maybe a piece of wood or something, just push that out of the way. What you're waiting to see is if chinch bugs will float to the top. They'll be black in color. If you see those, they're about an eighth of an inch long. Then you know you have chinch bugs, and you want to do this in that little section. If you don't have a two liter to use, take a a, a metal can, a can opener. Cut the top off, cut the bottom off, do the same thing. Fill it about two or three inches with water and keep filling it so that the water stays about two or three inches above the actual grass. If, if there is chinch bugs, they will float. You will see them. If they're baby chinch, chinch bugs, which are nymphs, they're going to be a little different in color. They'll have a little red and whatever. They won't be as black with possibly black wings. But with that said... A lot of times chinch bug damage is often confused with drought stress or misdiagnosed as a, as a, as a disease, brown patch, brown spot. And the appearance of chinch bug damage um, is devastating. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of a, uh, it looks, it looks horrible in your yard. Let's just be honest. It, it can turn your grass brown and it can die. And uh, centipede grass is generally not a severely green, like a dark green, like a Kentucky blue grass, green grass. It's more like a Granny Smith green, apple green when you see it. And um, chinch bug damage, they have little piercing mouth parts, basically, that can suck the sap out of grass blades. We're talking at the roots. And uh, they inject a substance into the plant that interrupts the water movement into the plant, the structure, causing it to die. So that grass blade will die when they chew on the bottoms. The damage begins usually as a small yellowing area of grass, and the grass will turn brown and die. And if the grass dies, chinch bugs move on to the perimeter of the dead grass, causing the dead patch to expand outwards while the dead areas may start out small, with heavy feeding, they'll they'll likely cover it 
and create a big, large debt area. So it can be confusing, you know, if, if you're if you're not in the lawn care business when you just see it. Now, granted, if you want to explain, if you can't, if you if you get a hold of a landscaper and you say, hey, listen, I want to show you something, if you can send them a picture of what you're talking about or trying to explain, it makes it a lot easier for them to be able to diagnose what's going on. Um, Something that, that someone brought up on the Facebook, like I said, there was an actual person who chimed in and I was on the same page with him. We're both experienced landscapers and a lot of people move from the north to the south. There's two different types of grass, turf grass in the north versus the south. And a lot of times people don't understand <laughs> with some of the larger, larger companies, they'll, they'll hire somebody who has long hair experience. It's mowing, cutting, blowing, grass, edging, et cetera. They don't understand the actual requirements of, we'll use centipede grass again, which is a low maintenance grass, doesn't like a lot of fertilizer. A lot of people see that, that, that problem, whether it's a homeowner who's moved here or it's a, it's, a, it's a new representative at a larger company, a larger landscape company, and they see it and the first thing they think is, oh, we need, to, we need to water it, we need to fertilize it. It, that's usually not the case with, with centipede. Centipede doesn't like a lot of nitrogen. And uh, that can cause more problems than you really want to get into. So, uh, back to the cinch bugs <coughs> or chinch bugs. The damage can be visible in, in late June through August and, and early September. We have a pretty late season here. We have a, a really long season, if you want to be honest. I mean, your, your adults from January to March – or, you know, they're up here and then they kind of die down about April and then they back up around May through late June, J July, they kind of dip down. August, they go back up, they go back down in September, they come back up in October through, like I said, again, March, they're prevalent, they're busy, they're doing their thing. <clears throat> now their eggs that they're laying starts about February, goes up and then it comes back down through about May, comes peaks again in uh, about middle of July, and then back down, and then peaks again in September. And these are the eggs that the adults are laying. The nymphs, which are their small baby chinch bugs, then you're going to see a lot of that damage happening, and, and they're most prevalent, they're most active in early March to late June, and then they peak again in between June, well, excuse me, between July and August, and then between September and October. So these are your, your areas. You may have a chinch bug infestation that may be misdiagnosed. Now, if your lawn's, you know, if it's if it's thick with thatch or, or if it's just a thick lawn, which may, you know, congratulations that you have a thick lawn. But these lush lawns are susceptible to the chinch bugs populations and damage since that they can, you know, the adults can get in there and feed and they can lay eggs. You're basically inviting them. There are ways to get rid of them. I will cover those. If you guys have any questions, feel free to uh, leave a comment or contact me at any of the social media's links below, and I'll explain what you can do for those organically, not organically, whatever you may choose. And uh, worst case scenario, if you can't reseed, you can't, <laughs> and you can't do new side. There's there's a, there's alternatives. Those are worst case scenarios. Um, you want to try to take a count. Once those chinch bugs float up, once you've cut the top off the can, the bottom, you fill it full of water, you waited five minutes, whatever's floating, you've kind of picked off any of the grass or any of the debris, and you, you see some little black chinch bugs. Adults are about, like I said, I would say an eighth of an inch long. And uh, if you see like a few, if you see any, that's not good. <laughs> but, the, but count the number of how many you actually see in that little, that little surface area. Or this large surface area, whatever, whatever you're using for the device to actually make them float to the top. If you see more than 15 of these little insects per square foot in the threshold, call somebody immediately <laughs> to treat this pest, seriously. Um, Cause it can take over your yard. It can do a lot of damage. Now I'm going to speak on so, the, the person who proposed this question in, in a Facebook chat, um, does have centipede grass. That's why I am I'm referring to this particular grass. It's used quite often. It is a medium texture grass. It is a slow growing 
turf grass. So if it if it has problems, it, it takes a long time to heal or repair itself. Keep that in mind. I've already explained what the color is. Centipede is not like most turf grasses that we have here in the south. Low requirements, except for water. You know, it needs water. I'm talking about low requirements in as far as fertilization. Um, if your if your lawn was super green all last year, maybe the year before, and now you're having problems, you may have indirectly pushed that grass too hard with too much nitrogen and cause centipede decline. That could be a possible scenario. The centipede decline um, is usually is usually easy to spot in spring when it doesn't the, the grass doesn't successfully uh, green up and it's followed by that 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 decline and that death in late spring and in like early summer or summer. And uh, the problem can be encountered um, in any any condition, basically. Um, but mostly it's 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 taking proper care, cutting the grass at the right height, inch to an inch and a half, making sure the soil is on the acidic side. It, I like to personally get, get the soil around 5.5. A lot of people lime in the north. Usually where I live, we don't have to lime unless a soil test specifically says you need to lime because that's basically adding calcium to the soil, which is going to going to move the needle further. So if you're talking zero to seven, you're talking acidic. If you're talking seven, which is neutral, to higher, you're talking a base. So when you add calcium, aka lime, to the soil, you're pushing it further in the wrong direction. Generally speaking, you're going to cause more of a problem. Um, if you do have thatch accumulation in your centipede lawn, Break it out early spring. I like to do that. I actually like to bag it and throw it away because it will harbor insects and fungus. Now, I think I've pretty much covered centipede decline, some of the factors. Um, plant nutrition, um, if the pH goes above 6.0. Um, if it goes above 6.0, here, here's, here's a big thing. Let's go. Let's go there. Iron availability for that grass is seriously decreased. What that means is when the iron deficiency causes the grass to become chloric or yellow, just keep that in mind, if it becomes yellow, then um, a high phosphorus level may also render the iron unavailable to the soil also, rendering the, you know, the same kind of symptoms. Centipede has this lighter green color that I was telling you about. You know, this, this foliage is like a Granny Smith apple green. And um, it's not like any other turf grass, like I said before. And uh, that unwanted or unwarranted nitrogen that you added the last year or last two years to give it a dark green, because nitrogen will make it green. Yes, it will. But iron is where you really want to go with that centipede grass. In between five and six, it will, it will take up the iron that it needs, and you can add an additional iron to it if it's in that acidic soil state where you can actually use it and not, not cut it off. Iron will make centipede a nice green, a nice dark green. It doesn't have to be Kentucky blue green, <laughs> but it can be a nicer green. Um, I personally like the, the, the lighter colors, but I can make it either way just by adding a couple things and doing a couple things. Um, thatch buildup. If you don't know what thatch is, it's basically a, a accumulation of dead plant material that's on the soil surface and you can just kind of pick it up by hand and feel that it's kind of like a dead material um i like to rake that out and get that out of the way if you can um that's just usually composed of mostly like turf grass stems stolones and, and roots but that thatch buildup can also prevent water from actually getting to the roots of the grass that can cause a lot of problems. And like I said before, it harbors insects, it harbors disease, organisms. And uh, you definitely want to take care of that. Rake that thatch out of there, get it out of there. Compost it if you can. Use it for something else. But you don't want your grass to become sub subject to drought, especially as we're about to approach summer. Um, even in the winter, guys, please continue to leave your, your irrigation system on so that your 
your grass, depending on where you're at, depending on how sandy your soil is, you, it may vary. You want a rough estimate, it's about an inch and a quarter a week of rainfall or irrigated water on that lawn. You can spread it out between two days, three days, whatever you want to do. Don't water every single day unless you're planting new seed. Um, and I'll explain that. If you'd like to know, leave a comment. I'll get into that also. I don't want to confuse anybody. Back to the thatch. The thatch is basically just uh, feels like a spongy turf. You know, it's all this excessive spongy um, turf grass stems, stolones, and roots. And just break that excess thatch out of there and, and, and get rid of it. Um, I recommend, like I said earlier, I do recommend a soil analysis. You can pick these up in a lot of different places. Send one off to a lab. They make different machines that you can actually stick into the ground and test it yourself and do different things. And there's different ways to see if you, the old time way to, to check with, you know, some, some household chemicals, basically to see if your grass or your soil is acidic or if it's, if it's on the more of the base side or on the neutral side, there's ways to do that with baking soda and vinegar. I won't go into that. I'm sure you guys can Google it and figure it out, but I would, I'd recommend that you actually do a soil sample you know, at least every third year at minimum. If you haven't, if you haven't done one, do one. That way you know exactly what micronutrients that your lawn may need and macronutrients. And that's what you usually buy with these big box stores, your macronutrients. Most fertilizers that are prepackaged at any of the big box stores, Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart, whatever, they have an NPK rating. That's what the main, the main thing. Also, keep in mind, if, if you're just feeding a synthetic, in my opinion, if you're just feeding a synthetic to that lawn, you're feeding the grass. You're not feeding the soil. If the soil is correct, this is the organic way. If you get the soil right, it'll take care of the grass and take care of the roots. When you're feeding just the, the grass with synthetic fertilizers that you buy, that has an NPK rating usually right there on them in these bags that you're buying, that is like eating the same meal every single day your body's not, not getting basically a wide variety of nutrients, vitamins, etc. Same thing with your grass. It becomes unhealthy after a while. I, I recommend top dressing lawns with compost. I recommend doing a lot of different things to actually take care of it and check in the micronutrients and get those correct so that they can balance each other. Once you have a lawn soil that is in great condition, your grass will take care of itself. The, so the soil will take care of the grass. You know, once it's in harmony, it's happy. Um, I can show you plenty of laws to make that, that statement true. <laughs> um, and if I do any in your neighborhood, you'll know. You'll see, you'll see the difference, that's for sure. Sometimes, um, this is generally not specific here it could be depending on your conditions in your yard but um if you'll take like a soil probe or just a screwdriver or a shovel and and shove it into the soil if it's hard to get in that means generally speaking that you have compacted soil there's ways to correct that with compacted soil it's hard for those roots to get water to get nutrients and if your grass blades have turned dull green if they've curled or if we're having extremely dry weather, you know, those things can, they can all affect to, to put a lot of stress on that grass to keep it from growing and do what it needs to do. Look beautiful for you. Um, some other things you want to look out for in spring and summer is a semicircle or a complete ring um, in an open area or around trees. I won't get into fairy rings in this, in this video. That might be a part two or whatever. But uh, fairy rings, I know it sounds great. Like, oh, fairy rings. No, it's not for your lawn. Not at all. Um, look for burrows. There's, there may be like a fluffy feel when you walk on, on this loose, kind of like loose soil or little mounds. Usually it's moles. You could possibly have mole crickets. I can get into how to fix these things, how to take care of these things. Even um, other things that, you know, 
people observe like in spring or fall, the large patch, the large brown patch, fungal infections, and, and how to cure these things and how to take care of them. I just need some feedback from you because um, I can't see your lawn. <laughs> I'm sitting here staring at a camera and uh, trying to cover some of the basic topics um, and how to, how to prevent and to correct these, you know, these measures to make your lawn beautiful. Um, if you're a new home owner and you're going to, are building a new home, there's, there's a proper way to actually, most, most builders take the topsoil right off and then they, they grade the land and they, they sell the topsoil. Those two to three inches or more, depending on how good your soil is, is what you need for those, for the grass to grow in. So I recommend if you're going to build a home here locally, especially since we live in a sandy area, that you try to keep that topsoil if possible. Um, there are preparations that you can do to the soil to make it better, have a better chance of just of growing. Because I see a lot of realtors here locally who just, like I said, scrape away the topsoil, sell it, build your house, make it beautiful. And the only soil you get on some really horrible soil or we'll call it dirt for lack of better words, or just to be generic, is the soil that's on the side that they lay down, which is not much. Um, you want to try to get is, I can't stress it enough, the best soil that you can get. If you take care of your soil, your problems will be cut in half. And you take care of um, some of the other things, like I said, I said earlier, with your fertilization practices, if you if you if you have centipede, just try to keep the phosphorus low. It doesn't it doesn't like it. It does not like phosphorus. Um, and your lime application should only be done with a soil test here locally. A common mistake is a lot of people like to um, fertilize centipede too early in the spring, and that usually just ends up feeding the weeds. I see that happen a lot too. Um, I like to wait until the temperatures are, are averaged and right out. Um, I know it's going to be kind of hard to, to explain to somebody. Um, soil temperatures to about a four inch depth should be about 65 degrees Fahrenheit for when you want to fertilize. <laughs> now you're going to ask me, how do you know that? How do you determine that in uh, et cetera, et cetera. I can, I can, I can get into that if you'd like. Um, air temperature versus soil temperature. You're welcome to Google it. You're welcome to look it up yourself. But I like to wait until spring has sprung. There's certain leaves on certain trees that I look for that, that judge my timing, certain other flowers that, that judge my timing, um, certain weeds that will help judge my timing. And then when I do fertilize, I like to do an organic. If you're going to use a synthetic, read the instructions carefully for the NPK, try to get something that's low in nitrogen. <laughs> I know that you want to, to get the biggest and the best and the baddest that you can get, you know, on that bag. You're looking at the NPK and you're like, oh, these, all these different numbers. One pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet is more than enough for centipede in a year. That's ample nitrogen, trust me. You can split it up in, in twos or thirds, or I like to do quarters and four and quarters and thirds. That way, I can I can uh, I can feed the lawns um, at different times. And um, depending on how sandy your soil is, let's say your ocean front, you may need to put two pounds just for aesthetics and for the grass to be healthy. Two pounds per thousand square feet per year. Keep that in mind. <laughs> this is a yearly thing that we're speaking about. Don't take two pounds and put it out there each time you fertilize. You'll kill the grass. If I haven't covered anything that you'd like to know, please let me know in the comments below or reach out to me um, via any of my social medias. I think I've covered a lot there. Um, I think I mentioned iron chlorosis. That's what the yellow, the yellowing of the leaves of of centipede grass. It naturally has this Granny Smith apple green. 
It's not dark green, but you can add different things to make it greener. Generally speaking, iron is the best. And I like to do a little micronutrients with it too. Um, just, just get your cultural practices for lawn care. Get a, get a system if you're doing it for yourself, if you're not going to pay somebody to do it. or and Even if you are paying somebody to do it, observe your grass. If it's not where it needs to be, first ask them you know, if there's anything that they can do to kind of help influence that grass to be in better condition and the soil. If they don't, search elsewhere. Um, and I'm not saying within the first week or first two weeks, give them time. Some things take time to repair. Centipede, like I said, if you have a large damaged area and you're hoping for it to grow back, it is not Bermuda grass. Bermuda grass grows like a weed. Centipede may take a long time to heal itself. If you were to do centipede by plugs, you know, for a lawn, it could take several years to fill in. Bermuda grass may take a couple seasons or less, depending on the size of the yard. We're just using a generalization here. Um, watering. Generally speaking, like I said earlier, centipede needs about one inch of water per week. I like to do about an inch and a quarter, depending on the the area i have a lot of oceanfront homes that i take care of here i have a lot of homes that are near the waterway and because of their elevation in that sandy soil it needs about an inch and a quarter to keep the soil depth wet or moist and we're talking five to seven inches roughly six if you want to call it that i like to keep that enough enough water in that wet soil to feed those roots that's a little further down than roots need to be, but I like to do that. I can stick my screwdriver in and check or my soil probe and check. Um, if you're getting too much irrigation, too much water, turn it down. Um, if, you, if you have irrigation and you don't have a rain sensor, install one. They're cheap. You can pretty much add them onto any system. Most systems that I run into are mostly Rainbird. Just a popular system here. Most home builders put those on. Most homeowners have put those on. Um, I'm not saying it's the best or, or better, but almost any system you can add a rain sensor to, and it saves you money and it saves your lawn. Because <laughs> too much water can drown it, and, I, and I'm just going to use that as a general term. Um, the excess moisture um, can do different different problems, different different things to your lawn that you're not going to want feed into the fungus, et cetera, et cetera. We won't get into all that. Like I said, turf grass irrigation, um, keep those, keep that in mind. If you need to, to take a little cup, basically a saucer lid, you know, that can hold, let's call it half an inch to an inch of water. Run your, run your irrigation each zone, test each zone, put three or four of those out in the yard. If you can't afford to buy a, a rain gauge, <laughs> set those out in the yard. Even a lid, even one of these little caps right here. You can use one of those caps. Set it out in the yard and see how much water and over how much time it takes to actually fill that cap or fill a quarter way or, or half the way and then be able to judge there how long you need to set your irrigation. 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes or more. All depends on your sprinkler head and the coverage that you're doing. If you have drip irrigation, we can explain that later. We can, I can explain that in, in person to you. Um, I, like to, I like to water most lawns early in the morning. We're talking 5 a.m., 6 a.m., depending on how big the lawn. If it's, a, if it's a commercial property, I may start at 3 or 4 a.m. because there's a lot of zones. I like to have it dry overnight. Let that lawn basically air out. I know there's going to be dew. People are going to mention there's going to be dew on the ground. Yes, it does dry over time. <laughs> And it does kind of keep it moist, but where it's not saturated, it's not soaked. And uh, the winds are not as usually as bad at night as they are sometimes early morning. Um, less wind and, and, and lower temperature with, with, with that water um, We'll get in. Well, let's just say let's early, early just water early morning. It's one of the best practices. Or late in the afternoon. And when I say afternoon, we're talking at this time of, at this time of year, 
six, seven, right before the sun goes down. Give it time for the grass to actually draw, to dry and to let the moisture go down into the ground. If you're watering midday, if you're watering at noon, one o'clock, the water's going to evaporate a lot faster, costing you more money. Um, and it, it may not have time for the, you know, for the times, the water may not have time to absorb into the ground. There's a lot of different things. Would, we don't recommend watering midday. The evaporation may be as much as 50%. That's, that's why I say it can save you money if you water early in the morning or late in the day before the sun goes down. Midday irrigation, I never recommend unless unless you're doing new grass seed. Um, a lot of studies that have come out recently, um, I can link those studies if you guys would like to know, but they're saying <clears throat> basically they suggest that irrigating after dew develops does not increase disease problems. I don't recommend it. I'm just saying that studies have su also suggested that irrigating after the dew develops will not increase disease problems. That's not proven. It's just a study. So keep that in mind. However, irrigating prior to dew formation or after dew has dried from the morning sun or winds or uh, wind extends the period of free surface moisture and the increase and the increases disease chances. Let's put it that way. Hope I didn't confuse you with that. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what else I may have not covered that I should cover. I think I hit it all. So I appreciate your time. And if there's any questions, you guys know how to get a hold of me now. I'm going to check my phone. Make sure, let's leave, before I go, before I leave, see if I can find this Facebook post. <laughs> Make sure that I covered everything. I kind of got off topic with a bunch of different topics. I was just going to hit on a couple of things. I was just going to do chinch bugs because a lot of people think that they have brown patch immediately. They run out and they go buy a brown, a brown patch, you know, remedy at a big box store, Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, etc. And uh, they'll put that down. The problem, if you do have brown patch, sometimes you need to switch it up. There's two different kinds of active ingredient that you need to switch switch up to have brown patch actually effectively treat it sometimes. Uh, don't see, let's see if there's a notification. Oh, no. He hasn't responded yet. So anyway, this, this video was uh, inspired by James. I won't use his, the rest of his name. James is pretty common. But uh, like I said, this comment, this 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 video was inspired by James. He's the person who actually uh, who started this this discussion on 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 a Facebook group area. I thought I would chime in, and then there was this nice fellow. His name was John. John, if you're out there, J-O-N, thank you for being you, man. And uh, from what I understand, John doesn't do landscaping anymore as far as maintenance. Now, he does, from what I understand, he still does. He's like, don't ask me either, uh, you know, because uh, he's basically, I, I think he's doing irrigation and some other installs, but he doesn't want to be bothered with it because he's not doing it. But he was he was very helpful, and, and he beat me to the punch on a couple of different uh, – on a couple of different – uh, suggestions, you know, that we, we have for preventing or correcting problems people may have in a lawn. We both, I, I think I initiated, I said, hey, please send a picture. That's very helpful. If we can't go, if you don't want to give us an address to come look at it, send us a picture. It costs you nothing to send a, take a picture, send it to us. Maybe if it's of a bug, if it's a plant, or if it's problems in your yard or problems with your tree, then we can help diagnose it a lot better because Sometimes people use different terminology. I try to keep everything. When I explain plants, I try to use the common names. I try not to use the Latin names. And same thing with <laughs> a lot of other things. I try to keep it in general terms because I, I've, I, I've, I've noticed that sometimes when I go out 
you know, with, with the knowledge, I get a, I get a confused look and they're like, okay, just fix it. <laughs> so I try not to do that. I try to reel it in. And I try to keep it simple. Um, the old kiss technique, K I S S. And, uh, I try to keep it very simple so that I stay on the same page and I don't lose people. And I try to keep it um, as affordable. Like when I mentioned how to check for, for chinch bugs, you can do it yourself. If you look at some of my other videos, I tell you how to, how to do things organically for free or for a little cost, how to get rid of crabgrass, how to get rid of Japanese beetles. You know, I, I, I want to save people money. Um, a lot of people in the lawn care business want your money. I don't. I want your business or I want your friendship. That's what I'm looking for. Honestly, I'm looking for you. I, I want your business. I don't want your money. If I have your, if I have your business, I'm, I'm going to get paid, but that's secondary. I'm looking to make friends and, and, and change things. I, I, I like to see a nice, a nice green lawn. Something that's being taken care of, the the pest management has been properly taken care of. The nutrients, the nutrients for that that particular yard is being taken care of because I know how greenhouse gases will will work, and I know how global warming kind of works, and I know what a lawn can do for us. I know what the trees can do for us as humans, as people, as residents here, as locals, as as family, as friends. I know what these things, how they benefit us, and I want to take care of them. I, and and I don't want to use certain chemicals, certain pesticides, certain things that can pollute our waters and our rivers and our our drinking our drinking water, <laughs> basically. And animals, you know, that's that's the other things. So you try to do everything in balance and in harmony. But I think I've taken enough time. This has been a pretty long live stream. I wish you guys the best. Any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much.